Next, I'd like to introduce to you uh, retired Colonel Jill Morgenthaler. I had the opportunity to hear her speak a few weeks ago at Benedictine University, and it was totally fantastic. So you guys are absolutely in for a treat. And I'm excited to hear it again. <laughs> retired Colonel Jill Morgenthaler a woman of, is a woman of many firsts. She was the first woman to enter ROTC and train as an equal with men. She was the first woman battalion commander in the 88th Regional Support Command. She was the first woman brigade commander in the 84th Division. She was the first woman Homeland Security Advisor for the state of Illinois. The Colonel handled disaster recovery during the San Francisco earthquake and worked as a peacekeeper in Bosnia and sheltered Kosovar refugees. Her performance in Iraq, for her performance in Iraq, I'm sorry, in 2004, she received a bronze star. Upon retirement, the Army awarded her the Legion of Merit. And, and I, I looked that up. So she, for her service, um, excellent, on top of her excellence of service, it was extraordinary and excellent and meritous. And I just think that that's phenomenal first woman. Um, she is a motivational speaker, thrilling audiences with her presentation, women, Winning at Work, 21 Secrets to Lead and Succeed, and Conducting Workshops, Leading from the Front. You can, and I'll stop there. <laughs> um, but anyway, without further ado, I'm so excited for you guys. You're in for a treat. Reverend Kern. In 2004, I was at home. I worked at Argonne National Laboratory, and I was a reserve soldier. I was a wife, a mother of two teenagers, and a mother of a dog and three cats. And once again, Uncle Sam said, I want you. I said, OK. So I headed off to Iraq. I was running all the strategic communications over there, which meant the newspaper, the radio, the uh, television, and the media. And any of you who have worked with journalists, you know that is herding cats. You want them to go over here, they're going to go over there. Well, Saddam Hussein had already been captured. He had been captured in 2003. He finally was going to go before a young, brave Iraqi judge on his crimes against humanity. I pulled rank. I told my soldiers, I'm taking the media into the courtroom. So I escorted into the courtroom Christina Amapour, Peter Jennings, Al Jazeera, Al Arakia, Al Arabia. No room in that little courtroom for me. So I'm hanging outside. And one thing I had been asked by the State Department was, let's downplay the role of the American military. We are transitioning to the Iraqi government. You know, this is about them. So instead of wearing my uniform, I was there in a, a long sleeve blouse, a long skirt, and my combat boots because I'm not ruining my sandals in that sand. <laughs> so I'm hanging there. And this part of the story was never told because the media was inside. But a bus arrived. Saddam Hussein got off the bus. He was shackled. And as he walked into the courtroom, his eyes were on the ground, and he was trembling in fear. And as I watched him walk by, I thought, oh, he thinks he's going to die today. He thinks he's going to have his hearing, get his sentence, and be executed, because that's what he did. Wow, this is going to get interesting. Welcome to real justice. So he's in the courtroom. I'm outside. Eventually, he realized he wasn't going to die that day. And he started threatening that brave Iraqi judge. He started threatening that judge's family, everybody in the room, what he was going to do when he was back in rightful power. And finally, this very brave judge kicked him out. And he came out. And he saw me, and he checked me out. Oh, 
And I'm thinking, no, no way. And I'm remembering my sister-in-law and my nieces in Kuwait, Figan, Azra, and Letitia, and how they used to have to hide when the Iraqi soldiers came through during the Kuwaiti war. And I'm remembering this little old lady who saw me in Baghdad and came up and said, I don't know where my son is. Can you find him? And I couldn't. And I remember the young women in Iraq who hid because of Saddam Hussein and his sons, because otherwise they could have been dragged off the streets. And I thought, no way, dude, are you checking me out. So I start staring right back at him. And I remember what General Sanchez said. General Sanchez said when he had looked into the eyes of Saddam Hussein, he saw pure evil. So I'm looking. I'm staring at him. I don't know what pure evil looks like. So I'm looking. And he's staring at me, and I'm staring at him. And he's staring at me, and I'm staring at him. And I'm thinking, no way am I backing off. And so we do this, back, forth, back, forth. And finally, he barks out this command in Arabic. The guards burst out laughing and take him away. I said to this other guy, whoa, 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 what did he say? Kill her. Excuse me. He used to kill people for staring at him. And on behalf of all women, we have so much to offer. I'm very glad in my belief system of knowing where he is, and I am thrilled to be with all of you today. So let's talk about the feminine leader. You heard how I was the, one of the first women in ROTC when we trained as equal with men. It was actually an experiment. I was at college at Penn State. And what happened is 1972, Vietnam War was coming to an end. They got rid of the draft no men were jo joining. So the government went, oh my gosh, I guess we better let women in as equals. I'm the daughter of a Marine. I watched my father live this adventurous life, save lives, see the world. Hey, sign me up, I'm ready. What they forgot to say was Uncle Sam wanted me, the men did not. No, they saw our presence, our presence as equals as the end of the military and the strength of America. The presence of women as equal would undermine the military, would weaken the military, would sissify the military, and the evil Soviet Union will triumph. Because women are equals. Oh, come on, guys. Seriously. So there I was at college. During your junior year, after your junior year, you go to officer boot camp. So I arrived there. I'm ready to show them. I'm the daughter of a Marine. I can do this. I grew up playing war in the Red Hills of Virginia. I'm ready. Bring it on. The best thing about that summer is I taught them about feminine strength. I caught them unaware. I also was clueless that I was teaching them, but I did. I was treated, there was only 83 women, by the way, over 500 men on a military base of, I don't know, 20, 30,000 men. And they were. These men were determined to break us down, make us quit, make us cry. And they called me the weakest link. They called me the girl. They called me the little guy. I'm not a little guy. Right then I knew their logic was a little flawed, but OK. I'm not taking what you're calling me. I'm not accepting it. And then one day, we were out there and we are playing war. And you never know what's going to happen to you. Your mission is go from A to B. So we're out there. We're with our weapons. And we're waiting to be attacked. And we're looking up. We're looking down. And all of a sudden, in the grass and the leaves and the trees, I see a pair of blue eyes. And I go, sniper! And all of a sudden, we're fighting. <laughs> The game is over. The guy steps up. You've seen him in the movies, you know, totally a tree, a bush. And he comes up to me and he says, you're the first person to spot me all summer. And I'm thinking, oh, the girl. And then I thought, yeah, dude, and you've never seen me shop. <laughs> right then, there was at least one mine open. 
the fact that we have gifts. We have gifts of observation, fine motor skills, things like that. And too often in this world, things are still built around their bodies, not our bodies. The next time I taught a lesson, it was because I was the little guy. It was obstacle course day. We had all these obstacles put in our way, and you had to figure out how to get around over them or through them. So this one obstacle, uh, Sergeant, uh, Cadet Muskorsky was in charge of. He's a big guy from West Virginia. He had joined the Army to get out of the coal mines. He was in charge of the team. And so we go jogging up to this obstacle. And I have to describe it to you because it floored us all. We were all stunned when we saw this obstacle. It was a wall of barbed wire, you know, rip your clothes barbed wire. But not just, hey, getting from A to B around or over or under the barbed wire. The ground was painted yellow to B. If you touched the ground, you were contaminated, dead, your team lost. You only were given two tools. One was a plank of wood on this far side of this contaminated land, and one was this rope suspended above the barbed wire. So there we are, we're stunned. And then luckily, Cadet Muskorsky, he got it. He looked at it and he went, I'm the big guy. I'm throwing myself on the barbed wire. Morgenthaler, you're the little guy. You're going to run up my back. You're going to swing across. You're going to land on the far side. You're going to throw the plank, and then we're all going to do it. Hua? No, no hua. I go, what do you mean? You're throwing your body on barbed wire? Are you nuts? I'm running on your body? Are you nuts? Shut up. Do it. Hua. And as he's throwing his big body on the barbed wire, I'm thinking, Light as a butterfly, light as a butterfly. <laughs> I wish we had YouTube then. <laughs> I have never run so fast in my whole life. I ran up his body, I grabbed that rope, I swung like Jane out of a Tarzan movie. I landed here, I got that plank, and with the adrenaline, I threw it. They caught it, they, laid the, they landed the plank down, everybody ran up, swung, we made it. We're chest bumping, that's when I learned how to chest bump. We're chest bumping. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then the officer in charge said, cadets, get over here. And I thought, oh, what did we do wrong? You see, everything that summer I did was supposedly wrong. And whenever you do something wrong, you do push-ups. And my face knew about every inch of Fort Bragg. I'm like, oh. So we come over, and he looked at us, and he went, your team just broke the all-time record for that obstacle. Excuse me? Would that be the team with the weakest link? The little guy? The girl? Yes, it would be, wouldn't it? Ladies, we have wonderful strengths, and do not accept what people tell you about yourself. You find your strengths, you find your passions, and you go forward. Now, let's fast forward. 1996, I'm in Bosnia. We're separating the warring parties. A lot of bloodshed, genocide. And fortunately, one day, the best man for the job was a woman. There, I also ran all the public affairs. And what happened is we had such poor communications over there that often the colonel I worked for, as a lieutenant colonel, the colonel I worked for would send me forward to report back to the general and him what was going on. So we would be able to tell the American people. So one day, this one village had violated the Dayton Peace Accord. So our American military was going to go in and confiscate their weapons. This is a very terrifying thing for a village when you still have fighting going on. So my colonel said, Morgenthaler, get out there and let us know what's going on. So our convoy arrived at the American post. And the colonel, the infantry colonel, had already left with the troops to confiscate the weapons. Nothing for me to do. I'm just hanging inside our little fortress, you know, kind of listening. And then a young officer came up to me and went, excuse me, Colonel Morgenthaler, um, there, there's four Bosnian colonels who want to see you. Me? I don't work here. No, ma'am, but you are the highest ranking officer here. And I looked around the room and I thought, oh, my Lord, I am. And they said, oh, and by the way, uh, besides those four colonels, there's about 200 people with really big sticks and big rocks. And I wanted to say again, um, I don't work here. Uh, this is not in my job description.